Hi, I'm Mike Cowell. I'm the director of the Business Innovation Zone. The Business Innovation Zone, or the Biz, was created to help high growth potential entrepreneurs and businesses in central Iowa. We provide a variety of services, including mentoring, consulting, counseling, validating business models, and help with access to funding for high growth companies. We offer also a number of networking opportunities, including luncheons uh, once a month and all day seminars on subjects such as marketing and finance. You can find out more about the biz at www.bizci.org. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, pretty excited that you were able to take some time out of your day to hear me talk and hopefully this is uh, worth your while. I am far from a professional speaker, so feel free to raise your hand, interrupt me, uh, ask questions. Uh, today really wasn't about me trying to preach anything. This is really just me sharing some stories. Um, I've been in business for myself now for about 10 years and uh, learned a few things along the way. I screw up a lot and, uh, and hopefully I can share some of that with you. Um, so let's see if our technology is working. Perfect. Uh, if you want to find me, uh, my Twitter is bhemi and I've got about.me slash bhemi. Um, as I said on Pericast yesterday with Jeff Wood, I'm, I'm really not worth following on Twitter, but you can you know, follow me and that way you can get in touch with me if you need me. It works pretty well like that. Uh, so uh, just a quick background on where I've come from and, and who I am. I grew up in Northeast Iowa in a small town called Hudson. Uh, so really no uh, ties to anything here in Des Moines as far as community or network, uh, no ties to any sort of money or funding. Uh, my parents were career individuals. My dad spent 35 years at John Deere. My mom is on year 20 at the local preschool. And so um, entrepreneurialism wasn't something that was part of our, our family or upbringing. Um, but I, I give a lot of credit to my parents and the, the business ethics that I, I think I bring to the table and, and just watching them in their lives. So a little shout out to my parents. Uh, I had to go to Iowa State. Uh, I have a degree in computer engineering, uh, which is probably not a, a fit for me. I, I consider myself probably more of a sales guy. I, I think I get more of a rush off of that, but was, uh, was able to finish uh, Iowa State in computer engineering degree. Um, I did intern at Rockwell Collins and at FedEx. And those were the extent of my corporate experiences. Um, but I knew just from those few uh, short stints that it wasn't for me. Uh, the big company uh, way of life just wasn't going to be a fit. Uh, just a quick note on, on anybody that's uh, watching this or here that's in school, uh, you know, get out and network. It really doesn't matter necessarily where you go to school. One of the biggest things I got out of my college experience was who I met and who I networked with. And so I can't say enough about that. Uh, so I graduated in 1999 and the bubble was all around us. Uh, tech jobs were everywhere. Everybody was making lots of money on the, on the net and it was really fun. So I was actually a, a May graduate and I had my lease was up uh, not until fall and I had planned to stay in Ames and, and probably drink too much and get a good tan and just enjoy life because the jobs were everywhere. I mean, what was the hurry? Um, and, but unfortunately for me, or fortunately, a uh, networking professor uh, at Iowa State offered me a job in Des Moines, so I, I actually decided it was time to make some money, and I moved down. And worked for a company called TRG at the time, they're now called Handera. And really didn't realize at the time uh, where I was because it was pretty exciting. They were the third, uh, it was like 7% market share, uh, third place device maker behind Palm and Handspring. And if you go back 10 years ago, uh, you know, Samsung, HTC didn't exist. Samsung was making TVs and other stuff. And I mean, Palm and Handspring were the, the leaders in this space. So it was kind of exciting to be in Des Moines, Iowa, working for a tech firm um, that was, in a small way, disrupting that industry. Um, obviously, we know where Handspring absorbed into Palm, and then Palm's, uh, that's a whole other story. So um, after a year and a half there, uh, a fraternity advisor uh, from college uh, named Brad Williams, and he's the CEO of Dexter here in Des Moines. Uh, he and I had, had maintained a good relationship throughout, and he came to me and said, I've got this company. We've uh, raised $55 million, as you can see, and then another $12 million uh, from a firm in New York called Apollo. And we've got 70-some people in Kansas City that like to come work for me. We need some help with the website, and I'd like to teach you how to sell. And uh, he said, you know, give this a year. You're going to be really, really wealthy because of the stock options, or you'll be out of a, out of a job. So um, what was really cool is, is in Kansas City, you had a lot of what you read about going on in, in the valley and the, on the coast. You had the, the game room, you had the catered lunches every day, brand new desks, all of this, this money probably being spent, um, I don't want to say poorly, but you know, on things to attract talent and do all the things that you'd read about and you know, going on again in the valley. 
Um, meanwhile, Brad and I were in a windowless 10 by 20 office in Ankeny, Iowa. Uh, we, we did not get to uh, enjoy any of that. We were down in Kansas City about twice a month, but uh, I call that my, my MBA. I didn't go to school after, after Iowa State for any sort of additional education, but being around a co-founder of a company that attracted that level of investment, and his story is amazing. It's about a three-hour story if you have time for it. Um, and just being absorbed around that. Of course, he kicked me out of the room when the really important conversations came up, but it was my chance to get exposed to that, that level of business. So um, I give a lot of credit to him uh, and that opportunity. But as I said, it was a year. He said it, that it would take, and I'd either be really wealthy or out of a job. Well, it was a year and a week to the day um, I was let go. So I was uh, uh, unemployed, and, uh, and, and happily so. It was fine. It was, it was, uh, I had a good warning and a good runway to uh, get ready for that. So. Um, I'm going to come back to that, but I just want to take you through just getting a little bit more of myself and just to give you some lessons that, that I feel like I've learned throughout. Um, so the early years, uh, just a quick anecdote, I think I was around nine or ten years old. We lived in the country, and I decided to uh, hold a garage sale just to, to, you know, it wasn't really a business, but I wanted to make some money. Uh, and we sold all of our junk. My brothers and I got stuff. We set up our card table. We did a little marketing around the neighborhood, got everybody excited about it. and. Uh, I had an empty shampoo bottle that I filled with water and I called it a squirt gun and I sold it to the neighbor kid for a quarter. I thought it was pretty smart. I invented a product and sold it. Uh, my mom didn't think that was very cool and I actually had to give the quarter back. So <laughs> early lesson in ethics, you know, be good, uh, do right and all that good stuff. So, uh, and then in college, uh, there was this awesome band from Omaha called Blue Moon Ghetto. That's long gone. Uh, but I became kind of the Ames promotion manager uh, by default just because I was a fan and got off my butt and put up flyers and always talked about them, got them introduced to Tom Smolik at Peoples and got them some gigs there. And so I want to say they played maybe half a dozen to a dozen shows uh, in Ames over that time, partially due because just I was a fan and I got up and did it. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, passion and doing something you love. And that was kind of an early, it wasn't a business, but it was something that, that again, I enjoyed. So it, the moral of this little slider is have some fun. Uh, do something you enjoy, but realize this isn't a hobby. We're here to do business. Um, and so you got to ask yourself, what kind of talents do you have? What are you born with? Um, what's your skill? What have you learned? What can you do? And then passion, what gets you up in the morning? Um, just a few notes, and I'll jump into some, some better uh, information here. So build a business model. Um, this is what will differentiate you from a hobby and a business when you figure out how you're going to drive revenue. Uh, Mike talks a lot about this. He's obviously got startupmodels.com, and he's got uh, the spreadsheet there that can help you build that business model. Uh, he preaches, and I preach, a book called The Business Model Generation. You can get on Amazon and look for it. It is a fantastic tool to help you visualize your business model and see the flow of customers and cash and product and vendors and all of these things, and it helps you really put it all together. So take a look at that if, if you never have. Um, as I said, I'm not a professional speaker, and I'm, I've certainly made some mistakes, so I just wanted to quote Humpty Hump here. No two people will do it the same. So while I'm going to share with you some of my insight, uh, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, and then just one piece that I've always lived by. When you're starting, be frugal, um, especially for, for a service entity or a business that's maybe one or two people. Uh, your spending habits impact the business. You may not realize that, but if you go buy an iPad 2 when maybe it's not time to buy an iPad 2, um, that impacts your cash flow. That impacts, okay, how much money can I draw from that business? So those types of things are things to keep in mind uh, when, you're, when you're bootstrapping and getting started. Um, you're going to need support. So uh, family and friends, you, you can't expect them to understand what you're going through. Uh, and you just got to live with that. You, you know, explain it to them best you can, but realize that's not their top of mind. That's not where their head is. This has really got to be all what you care about and not care what they think. Um, you, you need their support, but don't expect them to really understand it. Um, expect them to make some crazy assumptions. It always killed me uh, when I'd, I'd buy something and then they'd say, oh, you can write that off. Well, yeah, but I still spent the money to buy it. I, I get the, I get the write-off. Um, you know, I think they thought it was free, or somehow the government said, "Yeah, you're running a business. You can just write that off in your taxes, and maybe we'll even give it to you for free." But um, th there's lots of them, and they also, you know, they all think you're rich. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's a lot of very successful businesses that do very well with revenue. But there's a lot of small businesses that that pays their bills, and it's really not that much different than earning a salary at a, at a large company. So, a lot of assumptions. Um, Get your spouse's support. I was fortunate enough to start uh, my first venture, uh, single, very few li you know, liabilities in terms of like mortgage and car. I mean, it was, it was pretty simple living at the time. Um, married now, I've got a, a great wife and a, a almost two-year-old daughter. 
getting their buy-in and support to let me do the things that I need to do as an entrepreneur is very important when you're bootstrapping because you're busting your butt, you're working your, your tail off to try to make things happen, and they have to understand that. Um, vendors, uh, I'm going to tell a story about this time we had 70 websites go down. Uh, government and community resources. So in 2001, uh, social media certainly didn't exist, not in the format that it does today. Um, the business innovation zone did not exist, uh, at least again in this format. Uh, there is so much stuff out here. Um, I'm, the fact that you're here tells me a lot. Uh, get out, shake hands, meet people, understand what, what kind of resources. Um, then as far as support yourself, you need to learn to be honest with yourself. Um, I'm very much a realist. Um, I, I love pie in the sky and took, looking at what potential there is for business, but I'm always very real. And I think you need to, to support yourself with that and be, be honest with you yourself about what you're building and what you're spending your time on. Um, and then, of course, this is, can't be stated enough. Everybody talks about this. It's all about the execution. And I just want to clarify that I think some people get confused. Execution is not building your product. Uh, execution is acting out on your sales and marketing goals. So when you look at that business model, when you look at the financial planning, your execution is, is following through on those things and learning to adapt, not building your product and, and having a launch party. Um, the hard work, you know, Jake's got a product coming up. The hard work starts after you get all those things done. So we'll, we'll watch Jake and his execution. A little before, but... So um, time and money are key factors at the beginning. Again, your personal finance, where you spend your time, you need to be really smart with these things. Um, and then share and learn from those who have done it. Um, I've always hated, uh, and I, I do have in small, that's Nike's trademark. I'm not sure if I'm breaking any legal laws there, but you know, they always, life was short, play hard. And I, I couldn't disagree with that more. Life is long, take your time, get it done right. Uh, I know in the tech world, you gotta move fast, you gotta be reactive and keep ahead of the curve, but, uh, do it right. Build your business smart. Um, don't get in a hurry. It'll pay off in the long run. Um, I'm going to breeze through some of these. So these are some things that uh, you could write a whole other uh, talk session about these things. So understand your risk, your true risk, your time, your money, your reputation, your emotions. Um, there's a difference between assessing a risk and gambling. And, and it, you got to understand what that is. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail about that. Um, learn to manage your fear. So I had a, a professor at Iowa State, he looked at me and said, you have no fear. Uh, and that's not true, I do have fears, but I've learned to manage those things. So anytime you come to a situation, you say, well, God, I don't know if I can do this. You gotta ask yourself the other side of it. What if I don't do this? And, and learn to manage that fear. Um, own it, this is your business. You have to take ownership of this. Get your business card printed, get your name on it, be proud of it, uh, talk about it, promote it, um, really embrace it. And then again, I keep talking about sharing and talking to people. Uh, so, in blue there is a quote, uh, my buddy, we were all going out to the dance club, this was uh, the younger years, and, and we're all, we're dressed cool, and he's in a yellow shirt, it was ugly, it was gaudy, we said, what were your, and we weren't real big on fashion, but we were still like, well, you're wearing that? He said, he looked back, he said, in order to be seen, you must be seen. And of course, he was <laughs> talking about women, but uh, I think there's a real strong marketing message there, and, and you need to think about that as you're out talking to people and building your marketing, your campaigns. In order to be seen, you must be seen, always keep that in mind. Um, a few more tips. So again, I've already talked about the financial frugality. Uh, learn to listen. That was a big part when I was bootstrapping. Um, the ability to get out and actually listen to people. Um, there comes a time when you need to talk about your business, but it's also important to learn how to listen. Um, people talk about persistence. I'm not a big fan of just being persistent. You need to learn how to adapt as well. I think people leave that off the tail end of when they say, tell you to be persistent. You need to learn how to adapt, learn from what you're doing, uh, and know when to change. Um, and then a big thing that I did not do well, improve efficiencies whenever possible. So if you've got a task that you repeat a lot in your business and it takes a lot of time, um, learn how to improve that efficiency. I think that applies to tech, it applies to manufacturing, consulting, everything. So um, the, you'll hear people say, oh, I need to learn how to work on my business, not in my business. And that efficiency is the first step um, to fixing that problem. Uh, I never really overcame that with my first company. We were always working in it instead of on it. Um, and it worked out fine, but I think we could have been a lot bigger, better, faster if we'd figured out how to do that. All right, so back to uh, being dumped. I was unemployed in 2001. Uh, the bubble had officially burst. 9-11 happened. Um, it, was, it was a bad time to be looking for tech work. And uh, out of a little bit of laziness, um, I just wasn't going to look for a job. Uh, I knew how to build websites. And I said, aha, I'm a web developer. Hung up my shingle and uh, Diligent was born. 
And this was fun because this is a survival business. Um, this was bootstrapping at its core. I've got to pay the mortgage. Uh, as you see here, I had about a two month runway. That's not a lot of time. Uh, when you build a business and you build a plan, you hopefully got some investment money, maybe a little bit, not in the case of a true investor, but you got some, some runway. Um, I didn't have a lot. Um, but you know, I knew as I wasn't motivated to get a job, I knew I had a, you know, I talked about that talent, skill, and passion. Um, I had a, a skill for making websites. I had a passion for doing that sort of thing. What I really didn't know yet was that I had a talent for being able to talk to people and sell. And I think that's gonna be important. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about partners as we go. Um, I had a decent network um, established. One of the things I did, and I think this is probably useless now because of the social media and all the networks that are out there, but I literally took an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, and I made my network map. I wrote down all the people I knew. I kind of spread them out, and I wrote down the people I knew that I could probably go talk to and tell about my business. Do circles around the ones that you know, I thought would help me back, uh, and then do lines that, that showed tangents of who was what. And that helped me visualize, this is my lunch schedule. This is my phone call schedule. These are the people I'm going to spend time and get to know. Uh, it, it's not enough to just tweet, hey, I've started a business. You should do that too, but you need to go and, and buy lunch or have meetings with those key potential purchasers, vendors, to decision makers. Uh, and so that network map was really important to, to do that. And that was, uh, I think, something I just did, but I didn't realize the impact that it would have because uh, it opened some doors early on. Um, I also knew I didn't want to rely on anyone ever again. So that was, again, a, uh, you know, I say I was too lazy to go look for a job, but uh, I really just, in my mind, was, was kind of sick on relying on a business or something. Um, so again, low barrier to entry, let's build websites. Um, work hard and smart. Um, you've heard it said, you know, I don't necessarily work hard, I work smart. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk at Omaha said wisely, you know, you gotta do both, and I, I believe in that. Um, lean office space, so early customers didn't care. I worked from home for the first year and a half. Um, outside of HR, your next probably biggest expense will be that office space. You have to really ask yourself, is this necessary right now? Um, by the time I did move downtown, it tacked on another 1500 bucks a month in rent, parking, internet, all this stuff. Um, not to mention all the capital improvements of desks, computers. So when you're getting going, it's cool to have the office space. That's a nice thing to have and have that address. But you, you have to ask yourself, do my customers expect me to have that? And if the answer is no, then, then to me, you're probably wasting money um, on that office space. So really ask yourself that question. Um, I always stayed as liquid as possible. Uh, I didn't run up a lot of credit card debt. Uh, again, when you're in a survival mode, um, that next monthly payments due, the mortgage, the car, and all that stuff. So I always stayed as, as liquid as possible, meaning I didn't go out and charge things on my card. Uh, you know, cash was king, and I, I held on to that and spent it when I need to. Um, going back to that, learn how to listen. I understood the customer's needs, so as I was bootstrapping, getting this thing going, uh, I understood what I was good at and understood what they needed. Um, coming up here as we talk about learn how to say no, you gotta learn when, when there's not an opportunity, there's not an opportunity, and, and possibly let it go. Um, so understand what your strengths are. Um, when you're bootstrapping, another thing is you gotta answer the tough calls. So this is my own little quote. Uh, no one is something all the time. So our name of our company was Diligent, and it was based off of a um, fortune cookie. Imagine that, right? So the fortune cookie drove the name of our business. And we, my brother and I, we were diligent in what we did, but not all the time. There was times we screwed up, and so you need to just keep that in mind and not get frustrated with that if, if, you, uh, if you do run into that situation. Um, learn how to say no and, and, and when to say yes. Uh, and really what that meant was uh, early on there were some opportunities to do some consulting work, do some things that would have placed me into a bigger company, doing some tech stuff that maybe would have eaten up six months of my time. And I quickly shot those things down. The money was good, uh, but it wasn't part of the business plan. It wasn't where I was heading. So I learned how to say no to those things. Um, and then the, the learn how to say yes. So you get your vision and you get your focus. Um, every now and then you come across these opportunities where you can say yes and build something. So uh, Catchwind was the, the second company then that I, I helped found. That was a yes situation. Uh, and I'll talk about Catchwind and how that came to be, but there now is an opportunity, and rather than staying focused on what we're doing, I said yes, and that blossomed into something else. Uh, one key thing that when, when I was getting diligent started, I sat down with somebody and they shared with me a very simple graph, and one line went this way and said, that's your recurring revenue. And then do some more with some spikes, peaks, and valleys, and that's your project work. And that doesn't necessarily apply to, to every business, um, but if it can apply to you, I would highly encourage you to think about what can we do to build a recurring revenue stream, slowly but surely. So in, when I first started this thing, I think I was charging 10, 20 bucks a month for hosting. Well, if you've got three clients, that's not really gonna, that might pay your cable bill, but you're, no one's gonna get rich or, or sell a company based on that. But by the time we were done, we had nearly 100 clients that were paying us 
anywhere from $30 to $105 per month because of the, the value that we added and what we built. So those, that type of revenue stream uh, can really help give your business some solidity. And, and frankly, when it was time to get that office space, um, that's what allowed me to make that decision. I was able to say, okay, for the next six, nine, 12 months, I know this revenue is coming in. I'll lose some, but I'll get some. And so you can make those financial decisions based on that revenue. The projects and peaks um, were allowing me to you know, pay my taxes and, and mortgage payments and things like that. So you, if you can build your revenue model in a way that you have both elements, um, that will also help you when you exit because you'll be able to value your company on those two separate pieces. Um, maintain relationships by building trust, and I think this just comes down to a, a, a personality thing. You have to build trust with your clients and, uh, and keep them happy. Okay, shit happens. Uh, so early on, uh, I did a bid for an Iowa State, I, Iowa shop. It was in Merle Hay Mall or somewhere, and, and my bid came in at like three grand. It would have been, you know, it was like my first year of business. It's like, yeah, I'll make $3,000 off of this e-commerce website. Um, the winning bid, I think, got 18 to 20 grand. And so when, when I was done with that, I asked them, I said, well, you know, why wouldn't you save some money and go this route? And they looked at me and said, well, we didn't think you could get it done for that. So I, earned, I learned very quickly, uh, there's really two factors there. One is understand your competition. Understand what expectations are for the market and, and what your product is and what you're building, what people expect to pay. Um, the other side of it is, is you will uh, create a lack of confidence in your services if you do come in too low. There's a, there's a lot of movement in the tech space right now to give things away for free and under value. Uh, it drives me absolutely crazy. Um, I know it's working for a few companies, but in the long term, I, I don't think it's sustainable. So understand the market, understand your competition. Um, so, so I'll tell that story now about the 70 websites. Um, it was uh, September 12th, 2008. Uh, I was in Los Angeles for a conference for Ketchwind, the other company. And so we're already two hours behind, um, getting a phone call at eight in the morning, which was 10 o'clock in the morning here in Central. And it's my brother, a uh, business partner at Diligent, uh, said uh, the server with 70 websites is, is down. Well, it wasn't just down. Some joker found a hole in software that we didn't write on the server and put hacked by whatever on every page of every site. 70 websites, three of those were banks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, no financial information. Uh, it was just purely the front end, but still, that's a huge deal. Um, I don't have to be the one to, to say that. That, that. that is a huge deal. So luckily, we shut the server down. I think it was up for about 20 minutes. I want to say we had maybe 10 of those customers actually see it and call us in a panic. Um, and and the, what we did then over the next 36 hours really saved the business. I mean, it would have been very easy. That was a significant chunk of our, our clients. As I said, we, um, we had 100 when we were done. So that was a significant chunk of the, of the clients and most of the websites. So um, a couple of things that, that came out of that. Um, one, of course, Eric and I hopped right to it. We got a, a new server up and running. Um, we had good backups, luckily. Uh, we pulled everything across. Um, 36 hours of me working in a hotel in LA, Eric back here in Iowa, uh, no sleep, uh, crunching through, moving everything we had to do, recovering, double checking everything. Um, and and it, we, we luckily survived that. We got everything moved. Um, at the time, uh, with Ketchwin in LA, I was with one of my partners who was a marketing PR guy. Uh, and, and one of the other points to this story and things to pick up on is uh, it's important to have a crisis communication plan. And I didn't have that, but luckily I had a guy with me that would help me kind of craft that message. And so what we did over the, over the 36 hours is we kept in touch with our customers. Every time there was an update or new information, we shared that with them um, in, in a, a good way that let them know that number one, we know we screwed up. Number two, we are working on it. And three, here's what this is gonna look like when it's done. Um, so we, we got everything fixed. Uh, we came out of that not losing a single client. And, and I think that's, uh, that says a lot about the business that we built. Again, we built that trust, uh, the way that we acted when that happened. Um, so that, you know, a lot of things to take away from that. One is have a plan. Things are gonna break, stuff's gonna happen. Um, we had the good backups. Uh, we had a, a plan that if this did happen and we executed on it, so it, it worked. Um, the other side then too is just the crisis communication. Be ready to communicate with your customers. Um, everybody's seen maybe what's going on with Netflix right now. They've, you know, they've become a, a huge target of the PR industry because of the way they've handled all their changes over the last few months. Um, so when I started diligent in survival business, I had no intentions of, of building a business that I would sell someday. It was just, you know, let's again, let's pay the mortgage, let's get this going, let's bootstrap this, do it all from scratch and get it going. Um, we sold the company to a local web development firm uh, here in Des Moines. Uh, last summer. 
and uh, it, it, was a, it was a really great experience. Uh, I get asked all the time, was it hard to, to part with your baby, and, and it really wasn't. Um, the timing was good. We'd found a good company to put that with. Um, out of the 100 or so clients that, that moved over to them, I, I want to say less than 10 have made some sort of change. There was a few that just it wasn't a cultural fit, and, and that's going to happen. Um, but you know, for 90% of those customers to stay with them, I think, was a good decision. Um, we didn't shop that around. Uh, it was, uh, there was three things that when I sat down with David from Visionary, I said, oh, you know, there's three things I want to take care of. One is my employee, which was my brother. Um, so th there was that. Uh, number two was the customers. Let's make sure they're in a good place. And number three, the deal. And this has to make sense. We are in business at the end of the day, so we have to make sure the transaction is right. And all of those three things aligned, and it was, it was a really good, uh, good exit and a good experience. So that was diligent. Um, so as I mentioned, there's some things that will come across where you get a chance to say yes and, and take a look at another opportunity. And, and one of those came across in Ketchwind. In 2005, uh, a marketer here in town came to me and said, I have this idea. I've been to Europe. I've seen what they're doing. They're doing some cool stuff with texting. Uh, I think we can do this. So he pulled me in. Uh, let's see what this next slide says. So he pulled me in um, himself. He was the marketer. I was the tech. And then um, a guy that owned a nightclub here in town was our sales guy and our domain expertise. Um, and I'll talk about what we built, but I want to jump ahead for a second. So create, promote, sell, and support. Those, those are really the four basic building blocks of when you're getting started. If, if you can do all four of those things, and I could with Diligent, that was simple. If you can do all four of those things, you're solid. You, you, know, you, can, you can start that on your own. You can hire the right people, work with the right vendors. But if there's something you're not good at, if you really hate selling, I don't like talking to people. I don't like convincing them to part with their money. You're going to need a partner um, that can do that. So, so Ketchwin came together with the three of us, and we had those three roles filled. Um, so I'm going to, I'll talk about the product here in a second. I wanna, let's just focus on partners for a second. So uh, what was fun about this is this, this enabled us, me, the team, to do something greater than what we'd done with, with Diligent. We had now a concept that was scalable. It was something that could be sold all over the country. Um, we had people that could focus on particular roles, so it was no, no more of me being the janitor and the head chef and the web developer and the sales guy. I could focus just on the one thing. Um, and it, it worked really, really well um, because we each filled those roles. And so if, if you're starting a business or you're thinking about bringing a partner on, that would be one thing I'd really encourage you to do is define the roles. Um, literally write them down almost like a job description. Uh, it helps everybody understand who's responsible for what. So the, the roles is, is really important. Um, and this, of course, is, is nice to have. And you got to ask yourself, if you are going to bring on a partner, um, what do they bring to the table? Skills, connection, and money. Those, there's, there's more to it than that, but those are the three big ones for me. So if I'm going to work with somebody, if you bring all three of those things, that's fantastic. But if you bring just one, there's still probably a chance to work together. So that's, that's a question you should ask yourself. Uh, again, not only will they fill a role, but what, what are they really bringing to the table? Um, we worked with, uh, I'm going to skip ahead for a second, Volunteer Local is another company that uh, is in progress. And we worked with Sharice Flynn uh, at the time that she was consulting. And she brought to us a book called Strengths Finder 2.0. I know there's lots of different books like that. But that was my first experience working with something like that. And I would encourage you, if you've never tried the quiz or whatever they call it that you take, and you have partners to do that. Um, Jeff and I did that at the time together, and it opened our eyes to how we communicate and how we think. It was stuff that we maybe wouldn't be able to verbalize ourselves because, we're, again, we're internal. Uh, but taking that, that quiz and understanding, um, oh, when you say this, this is really what you mean. Or when I do this, this is why. You know, my background and my experience is pushing me to go this route. So it's, it's an amazing uh, thing to go through and understand that communication. I think that. Uh, that type of thing can work for even a company that's 20 years old. In fact, it probably can help them more than even a startup. Uh, another thing I strongly believe, someone needs to be in charge. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of even equity, 50-50, third, third, third. Uh, you can work that out on the, on the business side and the equity side, but someone has to say, I'm in charge. And whether you're in charge of one of these things, and the buck stops there, or you're in charge of all of them, right? You're the CEO and you're in charge of all of it. Someone has to step up and say, I am in charge of this. Um, if you go into business with somebody and you say, hey, we're 50-50, we'll just work on this together, it's going to fail. You need to define those rules and then put someone in charge. Um, legal documents, uh, please do them, especially if you've got partners. If it's just you, you can survive, you can get by because you can mix stuff up later. But if you've got partners, um, the three really important documents, uh, Articles of Incorporation, 
an operating agreement and a buy-sell agreement. Um, at some point you will, or your partner will, or you will want to exit that company. And if you've got it defined on how that works and you've set those rules up in advance, it will make life a lot easier. All right, so back to Ketchum. So what Ketchum does, uh, just real quick, is, is we send text messages. So you can opt into alerts, uh, daily deals, if you will, from any sort of restaurant, bar, a civic organization, anything that wants to communicate over text messaging. Um, we, we have the platform that enables that. And as I mentioned, uh, our sales, our domain expertise was a, a bar and nightclub owner. So hence our first product was for the bar and nightclub industry. It was a, a product called Text Promoter. And, uh, and we had a lot of fun. So being a tech guy, building websites right here locally, and now getting exposed to all the crazy stuff that happens uh, with bar owners and, and their shenanigans uh, was pretty fun. Uh, I learned a lot, I'll, I'll say that. And, and one of the big things that we did is we created a vertical market solution. Uh, that was one of the smartest things we did right off the bat. We had this brand called Text Promoter. Uh, and we went after bars and nightclubs really, really hard. And so it was, uh, it was a nice fit because we had the product that served their needs. We had the domain expertise that could get on the phone and talk the talk with these folks, and we were able to sell. Um, just on the screen there, those are the things that we did. I mean, we did just about every piece of you know, marketing concept you could think of. Uh, we traveled, trade shows, direct mail, bought lists, cold calling, trade publication, advertising. Uh, we did it all. Um, so just a few points here to take away. Having a subject matter expert was key to attacking that vertical market, as I said. Uh, we bootstrapped our early marketing efforts with an internal investment of 10K. Um, obviously, if you're going to do that sort of activity, you've got to have something. Um, you've got to spend some money somehow, either to produce some revenue beforehand, um, which is what we did then. So the revenue that we made off of that initial investment in the sales activity um, got back in the door. So quick story, the day we launched and went live, um, we get these things called short codes from the carriers. The day that thing was live, um, Frank and Mike hit the road to Denver. Uh, I mean, it was, there was no hesitation. It's like, we're live, we're gone. I got in the car and went. Um, again, taking the initiative, getting out. Um, got to Denver, we closed our first deal. It was 2,500 bucks a month from a client. Um, he had seven bars, and, and this is 2005. Prices have obviously come back down, and I mean, technology, uh, you'll see those prices come down, but at the time, that was very competitive and a good deal. So we, you know, the first week in business and live, closed a deal worth 2,500 bucks a month. And so it was very exciting. We did really, really well that first year, again, because of this, a lot of things I've just talked about. So uh, six months in, uh, we did take an angel investment. So I realize this is about bootstrapping, but yes, uh, we did take an investment. Um, just a quick background on that. So we presented uh, the Vinny, it was called VentureNet Iowa. I think it's changed or evolved or died or it's, it's different now, but we spoke at that uh, trying to attract an investor and, and we wasted a lot of time uh, with that. And, and I think, actually, I don't remember who I was just talked to beforehand, they'd, they'd said they've made the decision to not need money or not look for money. John, I think that was you. So it was, uh, for us, the biggest problem was we didn't know what we wanted to spend it on. Our marketing activities to date had been a little bit shooting from the hip. Things were working, but I don't think we'd done the science of figuring out what was working well and what was the markets we were gonna uh, move into or attract or go after. So, we didn't have a really good spending plan, which was part of the, the, the first problem. Um, but the other problem was just spending time with these investors. Um, and I'd be careful here, the, the scene has changed a lot. I think there's a lot, there's, there's, there's smarter people here, there's good money. At the time, it just wasn't. I think we'd, we'd engaged half a dozen potential investors and a lot of it was just a waste of time. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, but again, we didn't have a clear spending plan. And that was our own fault, so that was internal. Um, you know, Mike said it best, bootstrappers don't have the luxury of, of test markets and panels. So again, we were doing all these marketing activities and we, we had to kind of learn as we went. Uh, and that's always a challenge with bootstrapping is you gotta really pay attention and get your metrics and understand. Uh, and I just wanna clarify, an investment's not bad. Um, just justify it with the right numbers. Um, a strategic partner in the form of an investor is always gonna be better than, than pure money. Um, a strategic partner is, is usually defined as someone that's going to become part of that business in some way or shape. So when they make that investment, they are taking on some equity. They're part of your business. If they have a vested interest because they have a skill or a talent that they contribute, that's always the best way. So if you are out looking for an investor, uh, maybe change it a little bit in your mind to say, I'm looking for a strategic partner um, that has some cash. Uh, you'll, you'll get a little further ahead. So again, shit happens. Um, so I formed all these things in, in, a, in the shape of a question, um, but you're correct to assume that all these things happened. So again, I talked about the spending plan. So what happens when a, a client representing a significant chunk of revenue doesn't renew? A uh, year and a half into the business, we had a client that they didn't, can't, they didn't renew. Nothing we did wrong, they weren't 
tricked into another provider. Uh, nothing we did bad in terms of they wanted to get away from us. It was just they just weren't using the service anymore. Uh, it was a, a very significant part of our, our revenue. And so that hit uh, right about the same time that we had office space that was way too big. Um, I talked earlier about staying lean. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the Nova Ideas and Services, I want to say they have 30 some people over on Third and Grand. Well, that was our space for seven people and two dogs. So the <laughs> the uh, the the rent payment on that alone for for you know to justify seven people was crazy. You know, we we had in, in hindsight hindsight's always 2020. We had anticipated growth. We anticipated all the things of an emerging technology company thinks it's going to have. Um, just a lot of it didn't happen. So between uh, we were about halfway through that lease. Uh, losing that revenue, and then of course I mentioned the angel investor, um, that, and that was a debt note that we con you know, converted. So it was uh, a lot of expenses and, and a reduced amount of revenue, and there was uh, basically a panic of now what? Um, you know, you hear people say they had sleepless nights. I truly had uh, two in a row sleepless nights of just trying to think through, okay, how do we fix this? Um, Let's stay here for a second. So uh, I didn't put a lot on, on the screen for this. So just to kind of finish out that story and just tell you what happened. So uh, at, at that time, the angel investor was a friend, which adds some, some uh, more pressure to it. This isn't just an investor. You say, hey, we tried. You took the risk. It failed. This was someone that you know, I cared about, his reputation and, and my, with my relationship with him. So I um, found another partner that had an interest in the business at the time. Um, convinced her the risk was worth taking to buy into this business. Um, we did have some good revenues with the clients that were still there. Um, convinced her to come in, help me buy out those other two partners. Uh, we were able to get out of the lease, um, negotiated that, and Nova came in right at the same time, so the landlord actually worked out for him as well. Um, reduced our, our debt note to interest-only payments for a year, so we basically restructured that financing, which was really key, um, and then just got out and hustled that next year. Um, busted my butt selling Closing new clients, we picked up uh, Harris Casino out of Council Bluffs. We were one of three pilots um, across the nation before Harris was going to bring everything in house. So it was a, it was a short term gig that we knew going into it. But um, that was a nice land, and then just picked up a, a, an array of clients. Then over that year, um, got the ship righted. Um, I bought that partner out um, six months ago. Gave her a nice return on her investment, and uh, kind of cleaned things up. So we went from holy shit, uh, this could be done. Um, realistically uh, broke out of money, closed down shop, to uh, what now is I'm kind of restructuring it and, and restarting, if you will, now that I've got things cleaned up and we've got uh, some good customers and good revenues. So, um, I, you know, I quoted Billy Ocean because you should always quote Billy Ocean in your presentations. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. So just, you know, hang in there uh, would be the, the biggest thing, again, when you're bootstrapping. So that's Catchwind. Um, how am I doing on time? Volunteer local. Uh, then this is, uh, this is a fun one. So uh, one of my partners is here. Uh, Jeff is in the audience. And as I say here, it never hurts to have a little passion. So this is a really fun company. Uh, we are solving a problem, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a fun company in the way that the customers we are attracting. Uh, it's a fun company in the service that we're providing. Um, in 2003, uh, Mo Dana from the Des Moines Arts Festival approached me and said, I need a way to manage my volunteers. They had 350 some volunteers over two and a half days at the festival. Built a project for them uh, and then spun that out with a few new bells and whistles the next year. Uh, and we basically gave that away to local nonprofits here in the area for six years. Um, too busy with Diligent and Ketchwin to really do anything with this, but didn't want to just let it sit. Um, so we, you know, we did the, the free model, if you will, and, and actually gave it away to folks. And, and it was nice because it gave me a chance to see how they were using it. It was, it was really a six year beta test period. Um, I knew this wasn't gonna be a product that would get passed. It, it's not, um, you know, Ketchwin sits on the shelf long enough, the merging technology with mobile will pass it by. This is a little different. There will always be events, there will always be volunteers. So we had a chance to learn how they were using it and what they were doing. Um, so, you know, getting back to this, the theme of bootstrapping and you gotta own it and take, you know, manage it. So even though this thing was free and sitting out there, I was still promoting it, I would still talk about it. Uh, through my involvement with Variety of the Children's Charity, we were a group of us were invited to High V. Uh, the first year they brought the High V Triathlon here to Des Moines in 2007, and when they were done presenting and all this, how this would work and impact the community and the charity, I went up, handed my business card, and said, "I've got a solution that will help you manage your volunteers." And they were very polite, but they were just like, "Yeah, yeah, well, whatever." You know? And so, and I followed up then that next week with an email that gave them access to the system. Said, "Well, here it is again if you want it." And again, they're just like, "No, you're very nice, but no thanks." Um, that was in the fall of, of 
2006, I think it would have been. So fast forward then to spring of 2007. I'm actually in Las Vegas for a nightclub, bar nightclub uh, convention. And I'm on an email from Variety and Hy-V that says volunteer spots are open for the triathlon. It's like, shit. I didn't even hear from them. You know, they didn't use it, uh, nothing. I, I really wanted them to try this. Anyway, I clicked the link and it's my system. It's volunteer local. <laughs> no, one, no one called me to say, hey, we're using this. Um, so obviously it was, it was just that easy to use that they got in and worked it out. So that was kind of cool. It was, uh, it was the first like, okay, some, you know, a really big client is gonna use this. They pushed 1,600 volunteers through the system that year. Uh, I think this last year they did it, but now they're over, well over 2,000 volunteers a year. So that was kind of like, a, okay, we might have something here. This is, this is something that works for an event this large in a company with, of this stature. Um, let's see what we can do with this. So um, uh, Jeff and I met uh, almost two years ago, probably pretty close to the day, right here um, at a biz lunch. So there you go, um, networking, uh, getting out to talk to people. Uh, recognized very quickly he had some background that played well into this, so talking about partners. Um, I needed a partner in this. Again, I had too much going on that I couldn't dedicate time, so it was time to bring people on to help do something with this. Um, we did bring on two other partners then in 2010, um, filling the roles that we needed filled. Uh, we, with the help of the biz and Mike Caldwell, we received a demo fund grant, and uh, that was very, very important to helping us kick off our marketing. Um, and so, you know, back to this whole bootstrapping, non-fundraising path, um, there are resources out there, and I understand the demo fund may be under some fire, and hopefully that gets fixed, um, because I can tell you right now that was a really important, critical piece to helping us attract a small investor. Uh, as I said there, small investment in 2011 to fuel the marketing initiatives. And, um, and all this stuff, it, it is small. Um, these, these are not out raising millions of dollars. I mean, these are, these are these are five-digit, low five-digit marketing activities, um, and I, I wholly believe there's money for that kind of stuff in this community. Um, so I, I don't want to get up here and be a hypocrite and tell you to bootstrap, but yet I'm, I'm doing some of these things. Some of this money is actually very easy to find. Um, so you know, marketing tactics then for 2010, trade club application, direct mail campaigns, AdWords, and then a couple conventions that are lined up for yet this year. Um, very traditional marketing, but that's where our customers are for this business. So again, figuring out what that spending plan is and how do we get in front of the right people, um, that was what we decided. So, um, and really this year, again going back to that theme of bootstrapping, this year was um, focused on what can we learn. Um, the four partners all have some sort of thing, whether it's a full-time job or a side projects where that, that pays the bills and we're actually in a really unique position to say, okay, this business doesn't need to pay anybody right now. But what can we learn and what can we build and how our customers use it? And then can we revamp the business model after we've done this? Um, so I, I'm excited for 2012. I think we're going to see some, some really cool changes with this business. Um, so that's Volunteer Local. Uh, and then as Mike uh, alluded to in the introduction, uh, I am partnered with him and, and Rush Niggett in a new business called Notify Works. And I don't have any slides for this. Uh, we'll save that for another time. But um, this has been a fun exercise in bootstrapping as well. Um, uh, I've made a, a small investment in, in terms of time um, to help get this business off the ground. They're putting in a lot more time than me at this point now because we have launched as of September 1st. So again, now the real execution starts and, and we've got a, a marketing plan that we're working on and, and executing as we speak. So it's, it's an exciting time for this one and hopefully we'll have some, some good success stories on how this was bootstrapped and built um, into something bigger and better. So just some final thoughts. Uh, utilize the community and other resources. I've talked a lot about that. Uh, build a realistic business model and marketing strategy. Uh, be smart about picking your partners and your vendors. Uh, and embrace your bootstrapping. Um, don't apologize for, for bootstrapping. And don't apologize for not raising money or attracting an investor. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, if you build your value, uh, if you bootstrap and you build your value, you'll maintain your control, you'll keep your equity, and, and when that time is right for that investment, you can go after it. If that makes sense. You'll build that business. The money will come to you at that point. Uh, and so I, I can't encourage you enough to, to consider that as you're building your business. Keep it simple, uh, build it yourself, and, and work hard. So that is all I've got. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Sure. So the, the question is, is the decision between bringing on a partner and hiring a vendor, right? Is that in a nutshell? Whether you're technical or not, right? How do you, how do you decide to do that? Um, for me, there, there's with Diligent, there was no money, so that was easy. There was nobody to hire. Um, for me, that decision, so anything going forward, um, 
to me that decision is how much impact will that person have in the long term of the business. So if you're building a product that's going to be built and then really the focus is on sales and marketing, there will always be adjustments and adaptations. Uh, if really that's a one-time build and then you just get out and sell the heck out of it, to me that's, a, that's an easy decision to say hire it out. But if it's going to be a mobile application that needs to evolve and, and in three years when Apple's out of business, right, and Android is, I'm kidding, but so when, when crazy things happen, and so if you're going to need someone technical that's along with you for the ride, um, one of my sayings for technology decisions is um, choose the jockey, not the horse. So forget the technology is what that means. I don't care if it's PHP or .NET or Scala or any of that stuff that's coming, whatever's going on with that. Pick the person. That, that's going to be important, whether that's a vendor or partner. You need someone that's going to be around for the long run. Um, again, just to reiterate, the biggest decision between the two is um, a partner is better in the long run because they're going to have a vested interest in making sure it works right and works well. Um, that vendor may be gone in, in a, a year when you need them around to do more work or they may get very expensive. Okay. So the question is, what's my opinion on bringing on uh, labor in exchange for equity? So, so the promise that they're going to work for free and then get it paid off at some point. Um, I'm not against it. Uh, I don't know that I would personally do that. If the money's not there, then that's the only route you have to go. You can go with that. Um, it gets tricky then because those people are now partners, and you have to deal with them in the decisions that your business makes. Uh, even if you have somebody that's got majority control, those people are still along for the ride. Any partnership at any level is a marriage, and you're going to have to deal with that at some point later. Um, I think as long as the terms are clearly stated that says, you know, you're going to vest for this long, I mean, it gets into some legal work. After so long, you're your valuation is this when we hopefully attract an investor or we've made enough revenue to pay you back. I think you just have to figure out what, how you're going to pay them back, whether it's um, a chunk of money in the next, the first round of investment or if you're going to pay them off in time in which point you're kind of financing their labor, which may be all right. Um, but it, it, again, it all comes down to, I, I'd say to sit down and look at the money and what you may have to pay them down the road. But when you're bootstrapping and as long as you've got good people that that you trust and you think will build a good product, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. All right, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, everyone.